Hi, everyone. I'm Keith Vitale. Welcome to Sidekick Podcast. Before we get started, say hi to my producer, Corey Gomez. Hi, Corey. Hey, how's everybody? Hi, how's everybody doing tonight? I like how you lean in like a radio <laughs> broadcaster. You lean in to talk. <laughs> well, listen, I know you're as excited as I am about this interview. Um, it's such an honor, a privilege to have on this guest as an interview today. I've known him most of my, my uh, martial arts career. And get this, he's one of the most respected black belts, not in America, on this planet, around the world. And um, I love his tagline. His tagline is this, he's the father of American ninja or ninjutsu. What a great tagline. And please say hi to my good friend, Stephen K. Hayes. Hey, Stephen, how are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. It is wonderful to be uh, your guest uh, here tonight. Let's see what we can uncover. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably not the best at uncovering anything. And uh, <laughs> most people that do interviews are usually don't know the guest that well. And they usually just ask a bunch of questions. And most of the people I bring on, I've known my whole martial arts career. So we just get into into discussions and topics and then sometimes i forget the hour is gone I, I haven't asked enough questions or whatever so uh so just bear with me but this is very enjoyable for me i know um uh, we just missed you i was in arizona and i had a cameo role in black creek cynthia rothrock's you know western movie and then i left that friday and then i think you came into the next week how was that experience for you oh you know i had a ball um it was a lot of fun. Um, I had just gotten back from Japan. In fact, my wife wasn't even back yet and uh, flew to Phoenix real fast and uh, drove down there to the middle of nowhere, Arizona, you know. <laughs> and, uh, we had a lot of fun. We did a lot of nighttime taping. Woo, it was cold. It was cold. Was it and, cold? Yeah, it was really cold. Oh, this. And, uh, but what I was had, your role? Well, I, I played a really bad guy, a really bad guy. I was uh, uh, Richard Norton's, like, right-hand henchman. And, oh, man, we terrorized that town. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, you know, Vinny Akitas and I, we had a fight scene at 2.30 in the morning. And the wind was blowing. It was freezing, like, in the 30s. And everybody was just complaining how cold it was, but I actually enjoyed it because, you know, it's like reliving my youth again to have that experience. So I didn't mind it at all. So you have a good time down there? I had a great time. We really had a great time. And, you know, I was talking to Cynthia and uh, I asked her, I said, you know, you got all these martial artists that are in the cast. And she said, yeah, yeah. And I said, well, uh, I mean, can all of them act? You know, I mean, that's, that's not a foregone conclusion, you know. And she said, yeah, everybody's doing a great job. And I was there for uh, three days. And all three days, I I got to, you know, give that to her. Everybody did a great job. In fact, some people did such an amazing, I was just blown away. You know, these are martial artists, not trained actors, uh and they did a fabulous job, beautiful job. I was, I'm really going to be proud to be part of this uh, uh, film production. Me too. I'm wishing the best for Cynthia. She's such a sweet, wonderful person. And I, I just congratulate her for all of her efforts and being so brave to take this bold step to write, produce, find the money and put it together. What a great job. And uh, I don't want to brag, but it could be my best acting as well. I have no dialogue. <laughs> I just get beaten up. It's probably my best scene of all time. <laughs> Are you allowed to say who won, you or Benny? Oh, I get spanked. I get spanked. You know, I'm a bad guy too, but we're, it's just a cameo. And and uh, I just did it for her. I just said, I'll go down there and I, it was one of the best experiences of my life, of my, my martial arts career. I really enjoyed, okay. you know, seeing, reconnecting with all the martial art greats. You know, just imagine Don Wilson and Keith Cook, Benny Urquidez. Oh, my gosh, Richard Norton, Cynthia Rothrock. Is that like a roster or what? That's like a who's who. So <laughs> yeah. I was very happy. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. So I talked to Cynthia in January at uh, Alan Goldberg's uh, convention, I asked her, 
you know, how's things going? And she said that maybe by June, they'd have everything edited and oh. it go. So, uh, you know, you've been involved in movies before. That's pretty ambitious. You Very know, ambitious. Edit an entire movie. Whoa. Right. Whoa. They're producing. Anyway, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> well, I wish you the best. And uh, I know last time you and I, I have some photos of you and I, we at the Battle of the Land, I think a few years back. So I talked to you there. And so that was really nice. And I just want to give a shout out to the Viking Samurai uh, podcast. I was doing some research on you and I watched your full interview. You had part one and part two on his. And Ed David is such a wonderful host. He's so good at it. I'm learning myself and I'm I'm learning from people like him. But you did a great job on that show. And I learned so much about you. So it's kind of redundant. You'll have to say a lot of the same things again. But I want my audience out there. If you're ever searching for another podcast dealing with martial arts, there's no better one than the Viking Samurai. What a great guy. And we'll plug him in, in this uh, interview as well. Um, so I thought you did a great job on that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, he really was a great interviewer, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, listen, yeah. I intrigued you a little bit by mentioning Menachem uh, uh, Golan. With He's the owner of Canon Films. And you're not going to believe it, what I have to tell you. But first, I want you to tell me how you got involved with Enter the Ninja first. That was the first ninja film. So how did that come about? Well, you know, I've never, in all the interviews I've done and podcasts I've done, I've never actually told that story. So you get it here. You get it here. The first time. Wonderful. Uh, I This was like back in 1980. So I was 30 years old and uh, I had just come back from Japan. So I was uh, on a visa that lasted several years. My visa ran out and I had just got married in Japan and... Uh, so I came back and Mike Stone contacted me. I didn't really know Mike, uh, but as a kid growing up in Hawaii, he was fascinated by ninja, these ninja movies from Japan. And uh, uh, I can't say enough good about Mike. Uh, I flew out to uh, California. He, in he introduced me to the Black Belt magazine people. And they grabbed my story and did a bunch of things uh and that probably wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for mike and uh i had never done a screenplay before in my life and uh he got me this job writing the screenplay for enter the ninja and uh so uh, we worked on that together we trained a little bit and uh this was like 1980 sushi was just beginning to be introduced on the coasts you know <laughs> oh man we he had a favorite sushi place and all the movie stars would go there and we just had a ball we had a ball and uh that's the good part of the story <laughs> that's the good What's the rest of it <laughs> well the rest of it he's this Menachem golem he's a wild guy you know and uh so i had uh suggested that the ninja wear like a maroon uniform because all this night shooting. So maroon at night actually becomes sort of a model. Black is too extreme for the darkness. So uh, we had him in this maroon suit and uh, uh, well, they got to the Philippines and they said, well, we have to pay all this money for generators. So let's just film during the day. I said, oh, come on, you know, you can't do a ninja movie in the day. That's like doing a Dracula film, you know, on the beach at Miami <laughs> at noon. You can't do that. And he says, why, why? You know, ninja can't fight during the day? Oh, come on, come on. Anyway, they didn't get maroon. They got like bright fire engine red suits. <laughs> and these guys running around in the broad daylight. And, uh, oh, gosh. And then... Uh, one thing after another. So finally, I was so concerned, you know, with what my teacher in Japan was going to say about this, that I, I asked him, I said, don't use my name as the screenwriter. Uh, and so they, they, they put the, some name like Dave Durbin or something like that for a screenwriter. And uh, uh, all kinds of other things involved uh, as well. So uh, uh, 
and that was my introduction to Hollywood. <laughs> you know, and I teach oh my goodness. I tease people I, in Ohio, you know. I say, you know, all these stories they tell you about Hollywood being all thieves and liars. I say, That's really true. It's really true. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Menachem was a wild card, wasn't he? He, he had a reputation from being a wild man in, in the film industry, low budget films. But you're not going to believe what I'm getting ready to tell you. I did an interview for another um, podcast. It's called Retro Fiend Radio. And they were doing a documentary on just a, like a 40 year anniversary of Revenge of the Ninja, the second movie, not hmm. yours. So they asked me to be on the show and I agreed. And during the interview, they said, Keith, we've got a surprise for you. We have some raw footage of how you, you were hired by Menachem and the production crew. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, let me play it for you. And he plays it. What happened was there was a documentary. Some company came into Canon Films and they were doing a backstory on Menachem and the company. It just so happened they were dealing with Revenge of the Ninja the day they showed up to do the documentary. So what they were talking about is Menachem started off talking about, you know, needing somebody to work with. First, he didn't want me. He was just talking about uh, who we're going to get to play with with uh, Shokasugi. So anyway, they go back and forth and back and forth. And then he agrees. He goes, yes, I think it'd be good. I like him. Bring him in. I want to meet him. So that's my portion. I kept on, you know, he sent me the whole tape, which I'm going to send you later. So it's a clear documentary. It's incredible. As I kept on watching, he started talking to the, the um, Shokasugi's agent. He says, bring Sho in at five o'clock. So they come in. So cut to show sitting there with his agent and there's Menachem. And he looks at looks at both of them. And then show says this. Hey, he leans over. Have you reached out to have you reached out to my friend yet? Stephen Hayes yet? And then he goes, uh, no, he goes, no, um, but I like him. He's exciting. He's he's so great. He's so great with weapons. Oh, yes. And then Cho goes, I want him in the film. He goes, where do you want him as the bad guy? And Cho goes, yes, as a bad guy. He goes, I don't know about that, but I, I know we have a role for him. He's so good with weapons. Cho, he can win against you. Cho was mixed up. He didn't understand what win against you meant. So he just stood there and smiled. What he meant was he could beat you or defeat you or something. So Cho goes, you're not going to believe this. And Cho goes, uh, yes. Oh, I don't know. I don't know about that. Oh, I don't know about that. He goes, yes. Do you know how good looking he is? He is so good looking. He's better looking than Mike Stone. And and get this, oh, Menachem no, is excited no, no. about you. He he didn't know anything about me, so he wasn't excited about me because he hadn't met me. But he was so excited about you. He's, oh, yes, he's so good. Well, I think he could beat you, Joe. He could beat you. And then it cuts to something else. I always thought, and I just saw this recently, if you had seen that footage, you could have walked in to Menachem's office and say, Menachem, I want to write the next script. I want to be the star. He would have said, yes, that's how much wow. he liked you. Wow. But you know, it's one of those, it's one of those crosswalks in life where your life pivoted this direction and mine pivoted this direction. And you've led a very blessed life. So there's no regrets, but I'm just telling you, once you see this film footage of this documentary, you're going to be shocked how much Menachem thought of you. Wow. I had I, to watch it twice. I am blown away, Keith. Oh. I am totally blown Enough. away. That is, you know, you I'm still in touch with, with show. Well, we send each other emails now and then. And uh, um, I'm not sure what exactly he's doing, but, uh, you know, we're still we're still good friends to this day. We never were in a movie together, but, uh, you know, I really like him. And uh, uh but that, that story about Menachem Gold, that just blows me away. I'm, um, I just... It will. When you see it, <laughs> when you see it, it will blow you away. Because I'm, I'm not exaggerating enough how much he lit up. Oh, my gosh, he's so good looking. He's more looking than Mike Stone, don't you think? And Show goes, oh, well, you know, he was doing this. He did not know what to say. <laughs> but I was like going, wow. What a, I mean, so... It, oh, it, it's totally. So do you still have any contact with Mike Stone at all? You know, uh, we're Facebook friends. He lives in the Philippines now and he comes back to the yeah. U.S. 
But every time he's come back to the U.S. for a visit, I'm in Nepal or Japan or somewhere. Right, right. Oh, yes. I have not actually seen Mike for decades. But, you know, we send each other messages on uh, Facebook. And, uh, you know, Mike's a really interesting guy, you know. I mean, yeah, thank he you. was thunder and lightning on the karate competition scene. And so when I met him, I was very aware of his record, you know, and, uh, but he's a delightful guy, you know, he, and, uh, and it's so funny. He's become a poet. He's become a poet. He writes poems. Wow. He's changed. And, uh, he's changed a little bit. Yep. I think that is. Wonderful. Don't get this. You know, I was with him. Well, first, before I start on that, what do you think of Enter the, uh, the Ninja? Did you like the film itself? Hey, oh. Keith, do you, do you mind if I ask a really, really, really fast question to Mr. Hayes? Go ahead. Mr. Hayes, I got a question for you. Enter the Ninja. Uh, it's something that cinephiles like myself have wanted to know for years. Uh, Keith mentioned how amazing show was with the weapons. The opening sequence, I wondered if you wrote it or if someone else wrote it, because we see while well, the credits are playing, we see show or just the black ninja. No one knows who he is yet. And we see him using the size, the tomfas swords stars you know we even see him using the bow and arrow and the blow guns everything and then the white ninja kicks him in the face and he's done which basically makes him look kind of like a loser in the in the in the opening dun, dun, which is great music opening sequence whose idea was to do that it's basically telling you the white ninja is going to beat the crap out of you with with one move before the movie's over i'm just very curious about that we learn all about these great ninja weapons and he gets kicked in the head. Okay, well, there's a two-part answer. Uh, number one, no, I didn't write that. That, uh, you know, in writing a screenplay, what I learned was you don't put any of the details in. That's up to right, the director. Exactly. You know, yeah, you just go to the scenes. This is what happens. And uh, I had to be, and Mike was great. Mike Stone was great. He told me, oh, he says, you got all these details in here. The director will do all that. Just describe what happens in the scene oh okay so i think somebody else came up with that idea but then the other awkward thing is like atsai and nunchaku and uh, tonfa these are not ninja weapons these are okinawan karate weapons they were not introduced to japan until like the 1920s and uh the ninja would use a sword or uh maybe a staff uh shuriken Maybe, maybe some shuriken, and uh, you know. So there are all these, all these weapons, and I, <laughs> I remember there's one scene where uh, you know the white ninja is going up like a fire escape, a circular fire escape, <laughs> and, and you know, like the sai is bonking on the <laughs> uh, the railing, and uh, oh gosh, you know, it was uh, something, you know, the and. Uh, you know, they got Franco Nero to be the star. And I wasn't really up on that. Why Mike got pulled and Franco Nero. Do you know that, Keith, why uh, Mike was pulled? And well, I get this. That's, I was getting ready to tell you that at the same time, when you finish that film, I started hanging out with Mike Stone. Now, I'm 20 years younger, so I'm just a real young guy. I'm on the circuit and and he had been my referee some of my fights on the circuit. And I had known all the reputation of Mike Stone. So I would spend some time with him. I'm talking about all day and weeks with him. And we go play golf. He taught me how to play golf and racquetball. And we do all these things, work out together. But he was so upset personally with Sho. And he felt Sho was the one who went into Monacom and said, get rid, get rid of me. Get rid of Mike Stone. And we don't need him. We just need... Um, Stephen Hayes to play the Arthur Roberts part, the bad guy in Revenge of the Ninja. But Mike was always hurt. He said, Keith, he says, I did everything. I hired the show. I put oh. him on the show. And I felt I always felt bad that the show did this to me. I I didn't get in the middle of it. I never went to the show and say, why did you do that or whatever? But show was very territorial. When I made the movie with him, he told me, he goes, I have 48 weapons. And you can't do any weapons, only me. And I said, that's fine. I'm not going to do any weapons. And as sometimes in Revenge of the Ninja, he'd use all 48 weapons coming up the stairs. 
And I'd go, show, where'd that come from? Oh, no problem. I go, yeah, but you pull like a bazooka weapon out of the back. <laughs> I mean, be this, but where'd that come from? No, no problem. <laughs> but did you uh, ever get a chance to see Revenge of the Ninja? Uh, yeah, I did. I mean, it's so many decades ago, you know. And uh, the funny thing is, um, you know, uh, I did talk to Menachem about that. And, uh, oh, God, it's a very complicated, long story, because there was another group that was doing a film based on the Eric von Lustbader novel called The Ninja. And, I mean, they had a mega budget. They had a mega budget. And uh, uh, so they brought me in to be a consultant. And at that time, they were Robert De Niro was going to star. Now, this is 40 years ago. So Robert Nero was a young, you know, virile guy. And uh, um, it was so funny. Wow. Urban Kirshner, who directed, what was that? The Empire Strikes Back, the, the oh, Star Wars movie, really, you know. And, He's big time. Oh, yeah. Big time. Big time. So I'm talking with him. And he says to me, he says, did, did, did you read the novel? And I said, yeah, the novel when I was in Japan. I just came back. <laughs> and, yeah. He says, hey, did, did, did you like it? And I hated the novel. I hated the novel because so much was just wrong. And uh, but I wanted the job, you know. So I'm trying to. I'm him and her. Well, I said I was actually trained in the ninja art. And he he interrupts me and goes, "I hated it." I said, "Oh, okay." And he's going to rewrite the whole ending. And he's talking, you know. Okay, now you and I will be the only ones who know the ending and you got to promise, you know, you're going to sign a contract that you won't tell anybody what the ending is. I was oh, okay, sure. I'll, I'll do that. And I was going to live, live with Robert De Niro for six months and train oh him with, in this ninja martial art. And God, that night I went out for sushi with uh, the music, the music director of, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind and The Sting. I mean, hey, that, like, and yeah. that's an the, Academy Award winner too. Oh my goodness! Yeah, it was in the bag. It was in the bag, and then I came back what to it. Oh. And so I talked to Menachem, and uh, they never paid me for Enter the Ninja. And mm -hmm. so I, I mentioned that. I said, "Well, you know, I didn't get paid. <laughs> didn't get paid," he says. Greatly offended, you know. <laughs> he gets the phone. Cut a check for Stephen Hayes right away. Uh, he didn't get paid, <laughs> and so a guy came up with a check and gave me this. And uh, um, I wanted to do the big budget ninja film, so I told him, you know, I really uh, can't do two ninja movies for competing companies, and. Uh, so I'm back in Ohio and I get a, a phone call from uh how was Mike might have been Mike Stone or Joe Lewis was sort of involved. Uh yeah, he he kind of got me to come out. I you know, I knew Joe just because we'd bump into each other. Uh and uh, I never really competed, so I didn't know him as a competitor. But uh, anyway, I think Joe called me and said, Hey, uh you're mentioned in variety today. And I said, Oh, really? Wow, that's interesting. And uh, he says, Yeah, yeah. Um, and Occam and his company say you're you've joined their team. You're gonna do this ninja movie. And I said, oh, no, no, I'm gonna do the other ninja movies. Oh, well, and that's not what it says in variety. Uh oh man. So I called up my contact with uh, you know, Irving's thing, and they'd seen variety. And oh man, was it cold! It was really cold. Oh yeah, well we we saw you. You're going to work with the other company. I said no, 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 what? No, that, that's just something that they put in there. And uh, well, uh, <laughs> he says, well, yeah, well, yeah, you can't really do two ninja movies. So we we've we've gone ahead and we've we've got another uh, consultant for the movie, and so. Who? I'm the only. Uh, this is you know 1980. I'm I'm the only American who was trained as a ninja, and uh, you know, and, well, you know, this guy's good. He, he he's he's 
kind of coming up in the movies. I well, who did you get? And he says, Steven Seagal. <laughs> oh shoot. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. What a great story. And uh, so did they ever make the movie? Did they make that movie? They never made the movie. They were fooling around and then people's contracts ran out. And hey, look, we got to get moving here. And so they sold it to Roger Carpenter. You know, he's going to do it as a, some kind of a fantasy thing. And that never worked. And so it never got made. It never got made. And so Steven Seagal didn't get that job, which I was happy to see. <laughs> That's good. You know something, I hate to say that I'm sorry that the, the film didn't get made because I did read that book and yeah. I was just an ordinary person who loved the ninja craze. I yeah. like the book. Oh, okay. I would love to go see the movie because I want to know what's correct and what's not. You know, you have that perspective, but all of it's great. Even the red, the cherry red outfits in the middle of the night. <laughs> I go, hey, that's cool. <laughs> oh, well, good, 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 good. I'm too close to it. You know, I'm too close to it. Yeah. No. But I no. wish that had been made. Yeah. That would have been fun, you know. And I mean, it really would have changed my life totally, you know. I mean, goodness, these mega Hollywood people. And, uh, um, you know, so I thought when I was 30 and I just came back, I lived in Southern California for a while and uh, was kind of pursuing some movie things. And, and then uh, I don't know. And, and there are so many stories I could tell you, the almost and then it all falls apart. And so well, I, I always finally... think that there's a reason that things happen like they do. And you're such a positive person. And I love that about you. You have that outlook. And, and uh, I, you know, I'm, I try to be that way myself. I'm very positive. I know uh, hmm. we're talking about, I did that Revenge of the Ninja and Sam Furstenberg was a first time director and wow. he was scared <laughs> to death. Now he went on to do more ninja movies. He kind of started doing more and more ninja. He just loved ninja movies, but he was so scared of Menachem that I was on top of a building in Utah. It was like November, December, and it was cold. And I needed some underwear under, you know, just underwear under my clothes because it was cold. So I called down to the set and said, could you bring one up? Well, it happened to be a girl named Naomi who happened to be Menachem's daughter. She called her dad in California and says, Keith is demanding things. Oh. He calls up Shmolik. And Shimola comes running, he goes, Keith, what have you done? I said, what did I do? He says, Menachem is flying to the set. He's so upset. He said, because I wanted underwear, it's $10. Oh. I'll pay for it myself. Oh, no. But that's, oh. that was how we were working. When you have my low-budget movies from Menachem, that was the extent of it right there. But I oh. got along with Menachem, but it was, it was, the purse strings were very tight, to say the least. But uh, uh, it was pretty cool. <laughs> but...